what we've just sung really is the theme of every day of our life as a member of the Lord's church. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And that should weigh on our minds all the time. That we have such trust in God based upon His Word that we will obey Him. For as our Lord said, Why well, call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Today I'm going to speak to you under the topic of a day of small things. Now, I was going to put up Haggai 2, 1 through 9 so you could read it, but all that does is give you the historical background of what we're going to speak of. I'll be actually referring to scriptures outside of that passage more than I will to that one. But you might look there to Haggai 2, 1 through 9 if you want to and and find the record of the great prophet sent to the remnant once it had returned to Israel. And we'll be going into that. Because as Israel re began to return from the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, you can imagine in the hearts of those who remained faithful in Babylon the excitement. Now remember there would be a, a lot, and we'll mention this later, of Jews who had decided this is home and we're not going back. So you can be sure that the remnant who went back to Israel were very zealous and very desirous of going back to the homeland. And many of them, being 70 years had passed, would be quite young people or they had been very young when they came there. Because a 10-year-old would now be 80. So you can see that virtually the people that came were coming on the basis of reports and the study of the scriptures and who they were. They knew who they were from God's perspective. Zerubbabel led the first wave of less or nearly 50,000 people back to Jerusalem. And you might guess that there was a tremendous, that's pretty mildly, a tremendous amount of work to do because the whole of Jerusalem lay in ruins. But we learn from Ezra 3, verses 3 through 4, that worship started immediately. That tells me much about these people. They knew where their faith belong and they begin to act immediately on a spiritual level the following year work began on the foundation of the temple Ezra 3 9 through 11 this again shows that once they got to where they could God's work came first in their lives and the temple as you know the law of Moses was very significant to them and very important regarding their identity and their worship and service to God. I think we can safely say that it was a, as we express it today, a bitter sweet situation because that temple was not what Solomon's temple had been, Ezra 3 verses 12 through 13. And in the passage in Haggai 2, you can also see that expressed. Then too, there were people in the land who were not Jews. And they weren't the happiest, to put it mildly, that these Jews were coming back. So they met, the Jews did, with local resistance to the project, according to Ezra 4. Verses 1 through 5. And eventually, those local non-Jews who opposed rebuilding Jerusalem obtained a royal decree ordering work to be stopped on the temple, as of 4, verses 17 through 23. Now, what's interesting is that, well, what do we do now? We have... Uh, had from official 
sources, I work on the temple stop. And so while that's all rectified and ironed out and the truth of what we're up to and who is behind us coming here in the first place and that we do have a legal right to do this, while all that was being worked out, the people began to concentrate on their own houses and their own vineyards and farms and so forth. Thus, what had been great enthusiasm initially grew cold regarding the temple, those things that they did put first when they first got back into the land. So only about a year was spent on building the temple. Now about 14 years, and you think of the last 14 years, how long that is. About 14 years later is when the prophet Haggai comes on the scene. Now it's interesting, he's not coming there to teach them what they do not know. Remember, they were very zealous and fervent when they came. Remember their age back in Babylon and what had to be done regarding their faithfulness and their own parents teaching them and whoever could teach them regarding who they were, God's people under the law and the zealousness of the law and how that they'd had idolatry literally burned out of them uh, as far as that transgression is concerned. So Haggai was sent to stir them up. Have you ever been stirred up by anything? Have you ever been bothered about anything? Well, I think we all have. We might have been stirred up because we were actually upset. We might have been stirred up because we were happy. But we have all been stirred up. But Haggai's main work to do what God wanted them to do is to stir the people up. I'd say that had to do a lot with exhortation type preaching and rebuke. Work began, but after a month, and this is typical of any humans, people became discouraged. The temple would never be like the one of Solomon's day. And they rested in the past. They had heard stories. They had heard reports. And yet, they could not rebuild what had been destroyed. Now, if you look at Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, as I said earlier, you'll, you'll see some of that. That is, that he came to stir up the people. It's easy for us as God's people. They were fleshly Israel. We're spiritual Israel. They were restoring the teaching and conduct of the law of Moses to the Jews. We exist today because of the seed principle, Luke 8, 11. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Wherever you sow the seed of the kingdom in honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15, then it's going to produce what the seed of the kingdom produces, the kingdom. So we have today, and everybody we preach the word to, and they honestly hear it and obey it, we become Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts chapter 2. Thus they have come out of the land of captivity, having learned great lessons, full of zeal, but it's died down. And now Haggai is rebuilding them. And he is telling them, you can't, let what happened in the past stop you. You can't let what is not up to where it used to be stop you. The question would be this. You Jews here in Jerusalem, has the law of Moses changed? Immediately, they're going to say, well, certainly it hasn't. Then have your obligations to God changed at all? Well, of course they have. And this begins to allow us to make some applications of this to our day and time as spiritual Israel, the church. You know, there's been a lot of things happen since this time last Sunday. There's been a lot of things happen in a lot of places. This whole year, and the end is not yet, has been a day of all kinds of happening. Now let me ask you a question. 
You ever get a little discouraged? You ever be, get a little disappointed in people themselves? Do you realize that this past week that at least around 70 million of our fellow citizens said abortion does not matter at all to me? Said that euthanasia, putting to death and suicide and things like that, help people to die, it doesn't matter to me. They said transvestitism and sodomy and all that immorality. Doesn't bother us at all. But I don't know the Bible's changed, do you? I haven't seen uh, the New Testament change since last Sunday. It's still true that it's the only thing going to save a person from sin. I don't see people in, I don't care what happens in Washington or Austin or wherever the capitals are. The people that are there, now listen to me, are put there by the people of this country, and it's the people of this country that have to be changed. You're not going to change it from the top to the bottom. You're going to change it, and the only proper changes, and the true meaning of the word change is going to be made is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else going to substitute from converting your family, first of all, beginning with yourself, to make sure you are converted your family and your friends and your co-workers and your fellow students. Because the Word of God doesn't change with the passing ups and downs of whatever history has to say. The Jews were despised and beaten down. They had a poor self-image. You know, they always had sort of a problem with that. Remember when they were going over, originally the spies were sent out by Joshua to go into the land of Canaan? Ten of those spies said, well, they're giants of the land, and we were as grasshoppers in their sight. I think I have seen that hinder the work of spiritual Israel many times. Well, how can we do that? And you know, most of the time that works, whew, that costs so much money. We forget that the God of the universe is our heavenly Father. And He's promised every way possible in words on our level of understanding that if you serve me faithfully, I will be with you. Those Jews were in a land that was in ruins and their wealth was gone. We need to remember that only a small portion of the population of the United States and certainly of the world even gets smaller are true children of God who are faithful. Problems are great. Even as they had to have resources to do what they came back to do in restoring Judaism to Israel and rebuilding the Jerusalem and the walls and especially the temple, it was going to take a lot, to say the least. Well, it's impossible for them to do that without their God. Now here's where we bring down the point that is the name of this sermon, which has been, this idea has been preached on many times over the years. The day of small things. God works through small things. We have views because we're weak humans. How things ought to go. Remember Naaman? He had such a strong preconceived notion of just how the pagan religions he thoroughly understood and was a part of would work to cleanse him of his leprosy, 2 Kings 5. And when it was so little, such a small thing, when the prophet told him, did he go out and talk to him personally, he sent his servant out, Gehazi, and said, you go dip seven times in the river Jordan and your leprosy will be cleansed. Made him mad. Because it didn't fit his scheme, I thought the prophet would come out and do some great flashing thing like those pagan prophets did. And of course he had some sensible servants and they talked to him and said, well if he had come out and asked you to do some great and challenging thing you would have done it, wouldn't you? Yeah, well then why don't you just go do what he said? Don't you think that was kind of a small thing to go down to old buddy Jordan and dip seven times and coming up from the seventh time 
flesh comes to you again as a little child? You see, it was God doing it, so what's big to Him? What's little to Him? Tell me, what's big to God and what's little to God? I don't think you can apply those things. To God, I do know the Scripture is plain. God doesn't lie. And you've got a whole Bible saying, whatever He promises, He keeps His promise. Whatever it is, that to whomever He made it. So God works through small things. Glory would come through to Him to, by those small things that His people did. Glory that will prove to the world and to Israel itself that God accomplishes His will. We uh, find out a lot of times, because of the way the world works, there's a lot more of the world than us we'd like to admit. Because the things that depress the world, we find end up depressing us. And thus that raises the question, why? Why should I, a member of the blood-bought Church of Christ, why should I, as a child of God, and there are many of them when you look at the world, why should I let the affairs of this present world get me down? Now I'm to do what I can according to the authority of Christ and the words of the New Testament and be very concerned when it comes to religious and moral matters and why people do what they do. But we're not going to see any changes in the whole of this nation until there's changes at the individual level. And that's where it's fallen. That's where it's all come down to. Now let me ask you this. Is the gospel any less powerful today than it was last Sunday? Is it still, as Paul said in Romans 1.16, is it still the power of God unto salvation? And are we still to preach to every creature? And are we still, as I preached in Jude over a period of six lessons, to contend for the faith once for all delivered the saints? That was 2,000 years ago. Has it changed? Is the way that God saves us changed? Did Jesus become any less powerful in the last week? The church any less important? The worship of God, as he prescribes in the New Testament, any less important? The thing we need to know is that big things are accomplished through small things, and sometimes the way God does it in the workings of men is he lets things go really get out of a bad situation even while we're trying as his children to keep it where the Bible says it ought to be have you ever thought about Daniel and the three Hebrew children and there were others no doubt among those that went into captivity they hadn't been guilty of what sent Israel into Babylonian captivity but they went right along with the rest and yet because they went, look what stories of great faith come down to us which were written aforetime time for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. How could you have a Daniel without the circumstances, situation prevailing that caused Daniel to rise up and be what Daniel was in character and in service to God? Same is true of the three Hebrew children. Adverse circumstances and trials and tribulations are as much a part of growing and developing in faith and getting us ready for heaven as is the enjoyment of our fellowship and worship when we're all of one mind and one judgment. Enjoying a little bit of heaven on earth as we're all gathered here today to worship our God. We don't understand those things sometimes because we don't realize as we ought to this world this life in the flesh is a preparatory school. And struggles and trials and tribulations and even persecutions specifically because you're a Christian and following the authority of the Lord all fit into the scheme of things to make you stronger in the Lord. When you look at Job, you see that that's exactly the lesson that comes out of that. Job was a fine man spiritually before any troubles ever came. But because of his trials and tribulations, 
and his tenacity to hold on to the truth. If you read the end of Job, he was a far better man in service to God when it was all over with. The process that God has chosen to get us from earth to heaven is one of hardship. Why did Jesus ever say, take up your cross and follow me? He didn't say, follow me. Oh, you say, well, I read places where he said, follow me. But that's not all that, that the Bible has to say about following him, is it? When he says, take up your cross and follow me, then you must add, take up your cross every time you have, follow me. It all goes along the territory, and you see what is meant, as I've quoted many times from Paul to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why does God do that? Because He's shaping our characters. He's making us more dependent on Him. He's causing us to realize that He does not work like man works. He does not see as man sees. Remember when they were selecting David, what came to be David, or who came to be David, and David's own father, Jesse, left him in the field. And he chose of all his sons. He thought the king brought him up there. The prophet said, well, none of these work. Is there not another? And you can see Jesse said, well, <laughs> him a king? He's out there taking care of the sheep. I brought up here my boys that I know would fulfill the position. Now, Saul looked like a king. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. A lot of good that head and shoulders did when it came to facing Goliath because he was peeping out from under the tent flap like all the rest of the cowards. And then look who stood up. Somebody, nobody would have selected to champion Israel in answering the challenge of Goliath. And look at what Goliath said about David. He called him a dog. He humiliated him. Talked down to him. You ever notice that didn't shake David up at all? He just said, God gave this barren line into my hands. That's exactly what's going to happen to you. And can you imagine when he slung that rock and hit him right square in the forehead, and then David went up there and took the man's own, when God said that big knife, <laughs> took that sword and cut his head off. Can you imagine? Why, when you read that, do you just read a story? Why did God put that in, in the Bible when you read it for your own good? How is it good for you? Well, David, a pretty small thing compared to the whole host of armies of Israel. Big things are accomplished through small steps. We haven't learned that yet. And yet, you started from home today by taking a small step. And some of you, when you got out of the bed, you weren't even sure you were ready to stand up too fast to even make that first <coughs> tottering step. But you know why you're here? Because a whole lot of little small steps. That's why you're here. The lesson of the ant in Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, I won't take time to read that, Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, is there to teach us this lesson. Some of you who are teaching your children at home, or even if you're not homeschooling them, do what kids used to do all the time when they sat, they didn't, you know, they, they actually sat down and looked at a blade of grass or they actually watched ants or they gazed at bugs in the flowers or whatever. Take them and let them watch some ants working. Literally. And just quiz them. Tell them to look at them. Maybe we'll get them something, a magnifying glass. Look at it. I don't know. But look what those things do. And yet, such a little thing. They are small things. We have a false tendency to ignore or discount small actions. Is what it is. We preachers, we're the ones seen. We're the ones that appear to be, oh, how great or how bad, whatever view you have of what the preacher is, what he says. Uh, what he does. He is the center of attraction, whether you want to or not. Uh, 
That's what it is. Same thing's true of elders or deacons, Bible school teachers. So what we do becomes so many times the thing to do. And if I'm going to serve God, I must do that. Well, that's fine. I can't find that in the Bible, though. In Matthew chapter 10, 40 and 42, and we have a song built on this. The cup of water. If just a cup of water is placed within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. Now that's not meant to be satisfied with things that are far less than your capabilities. And to just say, well, I did a little bit, so I've done what I could. That's not the point. The point is, is that we do what we can. And many times, it seems to us, the way man views things is a very small matter, Matthew 10, 42 through, or 40 through 42. You know, a brief visit with a stranger, this must be a very important point. Did you notice the signal for you to take, take note there? A brief visit with a stranger, my, you remember this point, a brief visit with the stranger <laughs> may seem like a small thing. And it does depend upon what you're discussing and what you say. But consider Jesus' talk with the Samaritan woman at, at the well up there in Samaria. And note the impact of it. Let that sit in. Note the impact of the words of Jesus to the woman at the well. But not only just to the woman personally, but on the whole town. For she went back. And reported, then they came themselves and heard. John 4, 27 through 29, and verses 39 through 42. Many churches started in the homes of the brethren. I want you to notice how we think in America. Before you really can be what you ought to be as a church, Got to get to the point where you have land, build a building, and so forth. And if you go back a hundred and some years ago, and even less than that, you'll find out a lot of the churches had some land that usually somebody donated. And the building they had, and I like to look at these old pictures of these churches many years ago, they were just a white frame building that was smaller than this, and that's all there was to the building was this. There weren't any restrooms and lavatories uh, except outside in the woods. It's just a white frame building because they could assemble in it and do all in that assembly God required of. Then when people started emphasizing more and more since you've come together, you can study the Bible, then they would come earlier and you might have a group in the back studying this class or for that age bracket and over here and down here and here and sometimes in the middle. And that's the way it started. Then we, we got a little more money. So we built classrooms. And all of that becomes something we depend on and think we can't exist in faithful service to God without. Is it uh, something that's wrong? No. Not at all. And rejoice that we have it. But it should never come to the point where we think we can't be what God requires of it unless we do have it. These people had to learn in restoring Judaism to Jerusalem and the surrounding area and all that was involved in that, that the only way they could do it in the first place was the way they got right there in the first place. God providentially made it so they could return. Those that wanted to. And thus, each step of the way, and that was many miles across there, they got there. And in our day and time, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, Colossians 4, 15, Philippians 1 and 2. As I said a moment ago, churches started in houses. What would we do if all of a sudden 
we couldn't own church buildings. And here's the way it could come. And who knows but God. Just simply tax those churches out of existence. Well, they can't tax the church. See, that shows you again how blank we can be in, in, in our minds. Why can't they? Well, then what are we going to do about assembling as God ordains we must, Hebrews 10, 25, to worship? You know, we don't think too well sometimes, brethren. While we find a place to worship. Well, what if they tell us we can't worship? That didn't seem to hinder the church from doing what God required it to do when it was persecuted. They just simply secretly met. And I've talked to people in the old Soviet bloc countries in Eastern Europe who had to slip around to assemble. Some of us, I promise you, never would be able to do it because we can't even get to worship on time. One place Brother Gatewood was telling about, they had to assemble. They weren't to assemble. They did not have the freedom of assembly, but they had to obey God, and they were going to. So they started assembling two hours ahead of time so they could park a car over here and, or walk from here or ride a bicycle from there and not draw attention to themselves. Boy, that knocks an American in the head immediately. Everything we do is to draw attention to ourselves. Look at the signs. Here I am, now we do a cross. Whoopee! That doesn't make much sense at all. They would assemble over a period of an hour or two, do what they had to do in about 30 minutes. And the song leader, Brother Gary, didn't say, now sing up now. He said, we sang low. Because nobody outside that house we wanted to hear us. When they went out and baptized, they found a public beach. And they waited way out in the water where nobody could hear what they were doing. And they stood there and talked and said what needed to be said. And somebody just shoved somebody else under the water and raised them up. And they went back over the bank. And he said all the time there was one of the KGB men assigned to me standing over there watching, trying to figure out what in the world was going on. But we've got to make a big to do out here with that. You see, there has to be changes in the little things. God is so ordained, primitive, pure, New Testament Christianity that it will fit in anywhere when you want to do what's necessary to fit it. We learn then that little things put together makes a big thing. God chooses to work through things the world completely overlooks. He called the preaching of the gospel foolishness from the standpoint of the way the world looked at it. But it's not, is it? It's the power of God, according to Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. And I won't try to belabor the point. As you read your Bible, just note how many times God has used that which man would not consider to be uh, anything at all. And yet, it was. Eight people building an ark to withstand a worldwide flood out of what they had to do with dealing with something that had never been before and such a cataclysm that it would rise above the highest mountain and destroy everything on the earth. In fact, it changed the whole of the earth's topography. Eight people and an ark of gopher wood? Why is that in your Bible? What do you learn from it about being a Christian today and about living a righteous life? How often has God used single, seemingly insignificant people to turn the world upside down? You know where I go to that answer? Seemingly insignificant people. Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of fame chapter on faith. And all the trouble they went through, but they never knew the gospel. They were faithful to what God gave them, but they were never members of the Lord's church. And I always like what he said there of those people sawn asunder, wandering, no certain place to live, of whom the world was not worthy. Now that says a lot when God says it about people. The glory is that God always accomplishes His will. 
despite the seeming impossibilities of the odds. Isaiah 55, 11. God says, trust me. Trust me on the basis of my word. Quit trusting your human perspectives and concepts and ways of doing things and take me at my word. Can you imagine the look on Noah's face when God says the end of all the earth has come? Then he says to Noah, make me an ark of gopher wood. Would you like to have gotten that order? Make me an ark of gopher wood. Genesis 6.22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Well, I know I knew he could do whatever God asked him to do, so he said about doing what God told him to do. Oh, that changed so many things. We had that attitude. Again, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, Paul makes it clear that God's power is shown in weakness. You know, God's people have never been numerous. At the best of times, as far as number, they've never been numerous, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. God had to remind a great prophet who was very faithful when he thought the whole, he was the one, last one left in Israel. Yet God said, there are 7,000 have not yet bowed their knee to Baal, 1 Kings 19, 14 through 18. Well, only a small number returned from captivity, but Isaiah said they would take root and grow, Isaiah 37, 31 through 32. Only a small number of Jews compared to the whole Roman Empire became Christians, Romans 11, 1 through 6. But look what came out of them. It's because of the small number that we realize that people are not saved because of their own ability. That flies right into the face of most of the American philosophy, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. You'll have to trust God and do it His way or you won't go to heaven. Of the seven churches in Asia, it's the weak church in Philadelphia that no, that no fault is mentioned. Revelation 3, 8 through 10. Called a weak church, but no faults mentioned. It's the church whose members would become pillars in God's temple. So Revelation 3, 12 declares. We may be small and despise the eyes of the world and false religions. But if God is for us, as Paul asked in the long ago, 2,000 years ago nearly, who can be against us? He is the creator and sustainer of all right things. He is our, because we're his children, his family, heavenly father. You are children of God. Psalm 119, verse 141. He protects and he cares for even the smallest of his creation. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5. No one is unimportant, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 26. Everyone in this room and every faithful child of God is very important to God. If you're not a member of the Lord's church and all the New Testament defines a member of the Lord's church to be, you yet remain in your sin, separated from God. And he gave his only begotten son to suffer, bleed, and died for you. So that would not have to take place because you can't save yourself. I want to close by pointing out we get so down and out with the way things are today. And yet we haven't experienced anywhere nearly what our forefathers have. Coming down to me, as far as this world is concerned, has nothing directly to do with the church and Christian living, other it does show that things have been a lot worse than they are now. My grandmother told me back in the days of the Civil War when the troops came through, and her grandmother told her this when she was a little girl then. They were all sitting when the troops came up at the home farmhouse, as they did. And I know where the old place is to this day. And when they left, they had taken all their food, their livestock, they hadn't even torn open the feather beds. And if you know anything about a feather bed, you need to study some history. And all they had to do to have one and all that. And they just left them with nothing. And even took one of my kinfolks, and I don't know exactly the relationship, with them. 
He was sitting by the smokehouse reading his Bible. And I don't know what ever happened to him, but I got his Bible. To this day, I can't open it because it's too bad shape. Have you ever had that happen to you? Anybody? Your parents? Anybody? You ever had that happen to you? Have you ever lived in that kind of habit? I haven't. Things could get worse, couldn't they? On the other side of the family, they came from Kentucky. My grandfather told me that his mother, a little girl in that time, was at home and a Confederate soldier came. I don't know what was going on more than she knew that he was fleeing from Union soldiers. And he came by. They gave him something to eat and he left. Then not too long thereafter, Union soldiers came by and came in the house and searched it. So my grandmother made it, you know how things in a little child impresses them, sticks in your mind. And she reported to my grandfather, said, I remember one of the old men walking by and patting me on the face. His hand was black with powder. He said, I remember the smell of the powder in this day. And they went on off down the road and some good while later they heard gunshots and that was the last they ever knew about it. You ever had that happen to you? Times that bad now, folks? Oh, you say, but they could be. I am not interested in could be. You know why I'm not interested in could be? Sufficient under the day is the evil thereof. If I live like the Bible says today and do what all is necessary for a human to live today, what about tomorrow? Can you imagine how many people are worried about the things tomorrow? I mean, just ground down about them. And they're going to die today and never face those things tomorrow. And yet they'll go into an eternity they're totally unprepared to go into. I'm not giving any thought to that. What we need to do is realize God has put me here and I cannot do everything. But what I can do where I am, that I will do and I will do it by the teaching of the Lord. Whatever comes nationally, whatever comes. I still have the obligation to my God to preach the truth, to set a godly example, to seek the souls of men because that's where a place is changed. The whole is changed by the individuals. And the Bible's full of that material. And think of the times that you've heard sermons to a number of people this size and larger that are based upon what were private conversations by our Lord. Maybe it just simply tells us we need to be more mindful in preaching the gospel. Not to wait on being able to stand in a place and do what I'm doing now or do it a whole lot better. But where you are, how often are you being the leavening of truth and using opportunity to speak to somebody about their soul? Maybe embarrassing. Why should it be embarrassing to a child of God who was saved by the gospel that he wants other people to know? So there's a lot we can do. It is a day of small things. It has always been a day of small things. And it always will be a day of small things. I want to end on this note. When you have these big battles you read of in history where there's thousands upon thousands of men on both sides fighting one another, it's still a day of small things to that one single solitary soldier as he is engaged in his individual responsibility to fight as a soldier. Do you think he's seeing the whole thing the generals look at? No, he's dodging bullets right there in the hole. I started to bring this to Dan, didn't do it. A friend of mine published his letter of his father sent back home to his mom and daddy, and he wrote it in the foxhole in Okinawa in the midst of the battle. I think I will bring it just to read it sometime. But you don't see anything about him looking at the whole scope of Okinawa, one of the worst battles of World War II. But he talks about the personal things. And one of the things is, he said, if you poke your head up, said, you're going to get shot at. He said, I don't think, he's from Arkansas, I room with his son in college. He said, I don't think when I get home I can ever go squirrel hunting again. Because I know what those squirrels are hearing before they're shot. Because every time I've raised up, either I cross 
a shell coming in on me or a mortar round or hear those bullets zinging by my ears. And every time I hear that, I think of those squirrels I shot. <laughs> Strange how individual things. Now, is that a small thing? But they were umpteen, so to speak, soldiers in Okinawa and other places in the world. And it was the whole big picture we read about in history. But it comes right down to those individuals. If you're not a child of God today, you may seem small in the world, may never take note of it if you decide to rise up in faith in Christ and obey the gospel by being baptized in Christ. But heaven will rejoice. If as a child of God you've wandered and left the faith in some way or the other, repentance and confession of sin and prayer to God for forgiveness, heaven will rejoice. Oh, how important our souls are. In this day of small things, here's subject to the Lord's invitation. We bid you come while we stand and sing. <laughs>